and be glad in it. I'm going to ask you to join us in prayer. Lord, we do thank you. Praise you for all things. Lord, I thank you for this another day. I realize that someone didn't wake up this morning, but you were so good and so kind to each and every one of us to allow us to see this day. And for that, we say thank you. Lord, I ask that you would have your way in this place on today. Lord, open up our ears, our hearts, our spirits, so that we can receive what thus saith the Lord on this morning. My God, remember those that are on the prayer list, those that have asked for prayer. Lord, remember the Howard Johnson family. Touch their bodies, Lord, and strengthen them in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we just thank you, Lord, and we just give you the praise. I thank you for your word, because your word is true. Oh, Lord, I thank you, and it will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that that it is set out to you. We thank you for our pastor. Lord, continue to strengthen and encourage his heart. We thank you for him and just ask that you would have your way in his life. Lord, continue to speak through him as only you can. Strengthen and encourage his heart. We thank you for Lady Joy on today. God, have your way in her life. I thank you for everything that you've done, the things that you're going to do for them. Lord, how they have continued to remain an example over the years. We praise you for that. Lord, remember those that are lost, those that don't know you with the pardon of their sins. Have mercy on them. Touch their minds, oh God, and stir them in your name. Again, Lord, we just thank you, and we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise on today. In that name, that's above all names. Amen. We thank you, God, for the prayer. And at this time, we're going to ask you to receive our praise leader, Mr. India Man, is coming at this time. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a beautiful day. I'm so grateful to be here. Lift my hands, praise the Lord, give all of all of my expectations to lifting up his name and who he is. This one's really easy. Sing along with me if you know it.
Oh, is he perfect in all his ways? Is he perfect in all his ways? Come on, have you praised him enough? Have you blessed him enough for all that he's done? What a line, what a stanza. Perfect in all of your ways. That means he's complete. You're perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Two words. Say.
excited to see you all and see that you all are well. Amen. We're going to ask each and every one of you who have the capability to join us as we will be reading out of the Holy Writ this morning and where we're going to derive our foundational basis and premise for our text is out of the Greek scriptures, notably the Gospel of Levi, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. We'll be reading verses 21 through 35 in your hearing from the New International Version of the English Translation of Matthew chapter 18. And if you would join us there, we would be much obliged. Herein is the reading of the Holy Writ, Holy Writ, beloved, and it reads as thus. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Isn't it funny that Peter had a number in his head already? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, Christ goes on to explain, is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Pay close attention for this is intricate with regards to the foundational premise of our text this morning. Verse 23 again, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had been sold to repay the debt. Read that again slower. Since he was not able to pay the servant, that is the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Lord have our say. Could y'all imagine if uh, the banks and various different businesses and utilities had the capability to be able to go after us in a similar fashion. I know some of them wish they had our ability, ability to be able. Let's just stick to the text, shall we? 26, and this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Servant stating to the master and king, be patient with me. He begged, and I will pay back everything. Before we continue to read, I want to encourage you all, all those of you all who are online right now, those of you all who are gathered in the fellowship, uh, I pray that you can take it upon your heart to share this message. This is a message that has great impetus and has great essence, and thus is needed and greatly needed in this day and time and this season that we live in. You're going to understand by the time we close today, but I pray that you put it upon and that the Most High inspires you and he places it upon your heart to share this message. It would be wonderful if there was no seat in the room, not to hear myself or to elevate some human being, but truly today when we conclude, and by the time we conclude, y'all will realize that you have heard a word from the Holy Spirit. Hello? Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him. And we're going to read 26 again so that we can align ourselves and stay up to the measure and the point of what the premise is in this reading. 26, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him, exclaiming to the king and master, be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. Just give me time and I'll make you whole. Just give me a little bit more time and I will make this debt and what I owe you good. 27, the service master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Do y'all hear this this morning? But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver 
coin. Now he was a wealthy person, I guess that uh, did not expedite his affairs, Lady Joy, properly or fell on extremely difficult times and maybe ran into a, a, an inflated economy or a recessed economy similar to what we are experiencing in this day and time. Irrespective, he owed 10,000 bags of gold. Mama Woman came out of the city, dog. He owed 10,000 bags. Can y'all imagine at today's exchange rate? This was thousands of years ago when this was told. Uh, Cousin Joe and Vanessa, can y'all imagine how much debt he would be in comparatively today at the exchange rate of finance of 10,000 bags of gold? I don't know if I would have even showed up. Maybe they, maybe they had a warrant on him, uh, Madam Brown. Maybe they had to drag. And I don't know if I just would have volunteered to show up in court and I owe that much money to him. However, let's continue on with the text. He owed that much, but the person that owed him simply owed. Now, this wasn't going to put no debt. Can I just talk a little bit about this, Minister David? This, the little bit of silver that the person that owed him wasn't going to even put a debt on what he owed in his life. Despite that, he went out with his freedom and with his jubilee, with the clearing of his debt, encountered one of his fellow servants. It wasn't even so much that he had a business and that this was an employee, my boy. This was a fellow slave. This person was in bondage too. I want to ask y'all a question in digression, then we're going to get back to this text and complete it. How many of us are being stewardly operating in the kindness of the Christ with people that's in the same boat that you're in? Anybody looking down on somebody and you eat the same banana and mustard sandwich as them? Let me continue with this reading. 28, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. What? Did the king... I know it's taking us a while to get through this text. Y'all pray for Shepherd Man. Did, did the king order any of the guards in the court to do any harm, at least in the story as it was captured on the man with all of the debt that he owed him. You know, some of us, we need to praise the Most High that we're not the Most High God of the Hebrews. Because some of y'all, if I owed you that much money, you just put a hit out on me. It's just easier than just taking the person out, Sister Griffin, rather than so I'm not going to have any hopes of ever collecting 10,000 bags or nonetheless 1,000 bags. The way that you manage your finances, let me finish this reading. The man owed him a hundred silver coin. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees in the same motions as what he just exercised before the king and his master. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Wow. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. They went right to X, formerly known as Twitter, and they began to tweet about how could this person have the unmitigated goal, when we heard about what the king did for him, I mean, child, did you hear what happened to Silversmith? I just made that up, obviously, that's not in scripture. 32, then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, Jess? as I had on you, the master and the king asked. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. I think he was tortured for a long time, wouldn't y'all agree, that was 10,000 back. Plus interest, these with me, my lord. That's a lot of torture. 
Finally, this is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I'm going to read that again for the people in the balcony. There's nobody in the balcony. We don't have one. Nevertheless, verse 35, this is how my Heavenly Father, Christ states, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother. Listen, or your sister, from your heart. Oftentimes, we manifest empty words and never recover from what was done to us. We were talking on Wednesday and our exacting insight into the word Bible study and question and answer. And if you have not attended yet, you are missing the truth. But we were talking about this past Wednesday how the Most High judges and is a judge of the heart. Because sometimes words can betray what is truly centered intrinsically in your heart. Borrow this phrase from my brother. Dr. Rodney Small of the New Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church because I don't believe in plagiarism for the time that is mine. The title of our text this morning, beloved, is simply titled Reparations. The subject of reparations, particularly in the United States today, is a very touchy subject. We didn't just wake up one morning and suddenly things were the way that they currently are. We didn't just wake up this morning, Mama Woman, and poverty after decades and generations and trillions of dollars seem to still have a chokehold, particularly on the community that Shepherd Man emanates from in my family, for example, the African American community, or even many aspects of the Latino community, or in many aspects. Minister Wilson, uh, the indigenous community that claimed and that hold the position that this land is sovereign to them far before any invader or colonialist would come to these shores. After all of these generations, after all of these hundreds of years, there still appears to be a strain on y'all like, what is Pastor Man teaching this morning? Hang in there, we're going somewhere with this. There still appears to be a stranglehold on many communities. There still appears to be a disparate level of fairness with regards to wealth that is held. Uh, income disparity, as it were, and that leads to other things, such as subordinate levels of education, which also leads to subordinate levels of opportunity, which also leads to crime and degradation. Is there anyone here this morning? However, we didn't just wake up one morning and suddenly things were the way that they currently are. It took some time for things to evolve and in many cases devolve into the way things are in this world and in the United States where we live, particularly as it currently stands. Can anybody say just amen to that? I'm going to wait to see where you're going with this. No, I'll say amen because it's the truth. So many of us have been fortunate enough to be fortunate, but we know that there's a whole lot of people that are caught in a vacuum and a vortex, and they don't know anything other than what is surrounding them. Anybody ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? Well, so many people are eating unhealthy, then because that is the option that has been afforded to them, that is in what is close proximity to where they live and what they have access to. They don't have the resources or the transportation capability to go a mile away, or not a mile away, oftentimes 10 to 20, 30 miles away to Whole Foods, and when they get there, they don't have the resources to be able to afford what is accommodated there, so they eat what is in close proximity and accessible to them. Then we want to uh, rail against one another in this country and say we've got an obesity problem. I wonder why. See, I'm telling you that things took a while to get to where they are and now they're at the tipping point. Can somebody say amen? I'm not taking away personal responsibility, but if you are going to survive and if you're going to operate based upon the medial resources that is afforded to you, if people are not going to invest in the community that you're in. Some of y'all is like, don't tune off. I know this may be different for some of y'all. He usually seems like a pretty fair African-American preacher. When did he take a turn on the black 
liberation theology. That's not what we're doing at all today. You gotta hang in there. You gotta be patient. I won't leave it for you long. I'm just telling the truth today. I told y'all, y'all can't put me in boxes. I just want to talk about what is true. And today, we're talking about that things did not just get here overnight. This has been a slow and arduous process to the degradation that we see all around us. And just because you are blessed doesn't mean that you just simply sit by and ignore it. Now, I'm a fair pastor, so I'll say this. It's not going to help most people come in your neighborhood if the first thing you do is walk in there with a ski mask on. Can I Back to the text. We didn't just wake up one morning and suddenly things were the way that they were. Things have been promised to folks because of injustices and a lack of justice centuries ago that have never been made good upon. And we would just be implicitly and explicitly naive if we were to exclude that from the makeup of how things have concluded. We're talking about reparations today. Amen? And it is just pragmatic thinking that if something is broken, are you here today? Then it will require repairs if it is in fact expected to work properly. For example, let me go out there and take a hammer, hammer to y'all engine block, cousin Joe. Now, aside from the fact that first y'all might be surprised and hurt, why would cousin pass through that and didn't want to fight me? Because it does you from Philly, and I know you know you just don't take things laying down that way. But what if I was hopefully all those things will proceed before Joe starts swinging? But subsequently, because and pass go out take a sledgehammer to the engine block, you and your beautiful wife Vanessa live in another city away. Y'all got to travel a farther distance. Why would pass? I thought he was saying this don't make no sense. Now, despite from our response, I had to look at his cousin. I mean, his brother was his twin, my cousin. Despite the subsequent response that might follow such an egregious act, can we all conclude that with a fair amount of pressure with a sledgehammer system driven to an engine block, any of y'all's engine block, it would be deemed broken, would it not? Now, I'm crazy behind the light. Now, I'm spiritually speaking now. Have tried, and how, and how many of y'all are tired today? I don't put my hand. This is just us here today. How many of us are tired of sitting there like a broken cartoon on Saturday morning? I'm just a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. How many of us are tired of sitting behind these broke vehicles that we're in, acting like we're going somewhere? When practically, when in a pragmatic sense, if something is broken, doesn't it need to be repaired before it will function properly? Then why y'all get quiet when I started talking about all of the things that are broken in this nation, for example? For example, it's not what the message is about. This is not black or colored or pink. I got all pink. I got like my pink. Pink? Yeah, a real man. Master of the man can wear pink too. I'm just chasing it with a little bit of black, so it's just not too much pink. Say amen. But I digress again. How many of us, irrespective of what color or shade you're in, we need to get to the point which it seems like not even in a place that holds the most truth, which is in the house of the most high. We can't be honest about stuff that's broken, but yet we'll get on the news, we'll go to the battle box, and expect people to drive a broken car. When at the very least, it needs to be repaired if it's going to have forward mobility. Does that make sense? Just say amen to that. Now we're going somewhere with this because we live in a day and time where people, yes, on many layers, want broke stuff to function without repairing it. And it's just pragmatic thinking that if something is broken, then it will require repairs if it is in fact expected to work properly. Most folks view the term, here we go, I knew it. I knew it. That's why I ain't saying that because I knew he was going somewhere with that. Most folks view the term reparation from its relatively contemporary sense, which is defined as the making of a man for a wrong one has done by paying money. By paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wrong. Amen. The contemporary, atypical definition of how we view reparations. Normally, this is viewed 
on a national and international scale following the settlement of a conflict. Would we not agree? For example, prominent examples of war reparations include Carthage's North Africa currently, indemnity to Rome following the First Punic War, where Hannibal got on his elephants and traveled across the Alps in a very mysterious way. People wouldn't believe that they would survive the sojourns, none less, uh, you know, animals such as the elephant and attacking the Roman nation successfully in many regards, that is. French reparations following the Napoleonic Wars, Haiti's reparations to France following the Haitian War of Independence, French reparations to Germany following the Franco-Prussian War, and German reparations following World War I, for example. The 40 acres and a mule promised to free slaves of Africans after the American emancipation of slavery has famously never been realized, however. Even despite reparations notably being paid to Americans of Japanese descent due to their internment during World War II. But everybody can excel this morning. If I just take a breath and let it out. Because the Holy Spirit has commissioned me to share a slightly different angle of viewing reparations this morning. Did we not just say amen and concur that oftentimes we can agree that things are broken and have not been addressed and so many people despite that they expect stuff to work anyhow. So, if that is true and if we agree upon that point, exactly true is about living through the word and about finding real spiritual solutions. So we shouldn't come in here today and just spew about reparations without seeking the Holy Ghost with regards to a way in which we have power and authority to be change agents. Once again, it was Gandhi's son. A lot of people attributed to him, but it was his son that is on record for saying that you should be the change that you want to see in the world. So, exhale. Holy Spirit has given us a different and more powerful and effective way to approach this so that we can begin to exact, somebody say exact, change. Now y'all leaving me by myself, that's fine. It's good that I have the experience that I have as I've been ministering before the people in the public since I was seven years old. So if y'all want to say it then this morning, I can preach on anyhow. The now reparation as it is defined in its etymological origin, is defined as the act of repairing, somebody say repairing, repairing. or making amends by offering expiation. Expiation meaning the act of making amends or atonement for guilt or wrongdoing, or giving satisfaction for a wrong or injury, something done or given as amends or to satisfy a debt or an issue. Have you ever heard the phrase, they have much to atone for? Or, we have much to atone for? Y'all ever heard that phrase? Yeah, I know I have. If a situation or a circumstance is in fact in dire need of much repair, such as the scenario where I break cousin's engine. As the etymological root of the term reparation means to repair, that's what it means. Then how in the world are we expecting situations in our lives to truly resolve themselves without a literal effort to repair what is broken? Now, so many of us see or feel justifiably so, that not just in a macro sense politically and social economically in this country, certain groups, underprivileged, underserved groups, simply need to just be made whole with what has been promised them. Now, we'll agree to that, but we won't agree to a system of how the actual essence, etymologically of the word means, 
how are we going to repair? Because reparation don't just mean that matter falls from heaven. It means that something and an effort needs to take place to repair something because it's broken. There's many people declaring that you and Lady Joy don't need reparations, or Mark and Kim the Davis don't need reparations, or Sister Griffin don't need reparations, or Vanessa or Joe don't need reparations. For all intents and purposes, what we see, y'all are not broken. Who are you to determine on the surface what has broken, or what is broken, or what is fixed or not? I'm going somewhere with this. Why are we expecting to arrive at a place of satisfaction in life when there has been no truthful effort to reconcile between obstinate parties? So many of you all, now, we've taken this deeper because it actually goes and permeates beneath the surface. Can we, can we infiltrate this into our own homes? How are we supposed to ultimately live whole and in satisfaction when you have not reconciled one negative phrase or bad word that y'all ever said to one another? Is anybody still praying for Shepherd Man? As y'all can see that this is yes, taking sir. a turn. It's not just about somebody giving African Americans billions of dollars. Who gonna reconcile with somebody who you made love to? That's why I said made love to. Poor children with, and then you talk, you call them the worst thing that you could possibly fathom over something very simple. Right. And guess what? Your fruit shows that you never got over it. And reparations are needed because it has the propensity, that spirit, and those actions of going into the next generation. But yet when we come out in public, everybody put on you know, nice garbs and everything, and we've been acting a fool all this morning, but don't let nobody in on what's going on here. Let's look like that everything is good despite the fact. How are you going to walk in satisfaction and you have to reconcile a thing that was said? How are you going to go to your holiday? I'm messing with somebody today. Hopefully, y'all, everybody had a long off on that. How are we going to go to our respective holidays with relatives eating bread knowing that there's poisonous and toxic interactions that happened long ago that still have not been apologized for, made right? And you're going to eat the bread anyway. And then had a nerve on your way home in the car talking about, yeah, did you realize that just like on cue, just like every year, Auntie so-and-so's dressing is nasty like it usually is. Was the dressing really nasty? Is it nasty, Secretary David? Was it really horrible or despicable? Or was the flavor and the seasoning of your ill repair impacting how even the food and your taste buds would react? to that auntie in which situations have never been made right with you. What you doing there? I thought it was a holiday. Y'all not going to make me, allow me to change it. We don't control people at exactly true ministry. You can ho, ho, ho all you want to, irrespective of the knowledge of Santa uh, uh, Rhea and all of the different places, Santa Delia rather, and all of the different pagan origins that this stuff came from. I told y'all to start your own, I'm digressing, to start your own traditions and holiday. I love silver, man. Some of y'all feel like, that ain't no big deal. You know, we still uh, uh, celebrating the birth of the Christ. Don't nobody know when Christ was born. They, they don't have no direct record. And the most accurate depictions from theologians and the historians say that it happened more in the spring than in the fall. But we can't point to whose birthdays were celebrated before the Catholic Church began to hijack and say, we're going to put this day on this day to try to get people to assimilate from there. Now, y'all don't want me to go there, so I'm not going to stay there that long. We ho 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 it. There's people that's part of the ministry, that's part of a whole whole project right now. I don't control people. I speak the truth, operate on my own convictions, and you know what? Yeah, I'm going to be getting with my family as well during this holiday season, but it's like I'm thinking and we're developing our own commemorations and our own traditions and celebrations as we should. You can hear an ant crawl. <laughs> See, that's what we do. I didn't do that to pick with y'all holiday. Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and, and all these different things. I didn't do that to pick with that as much as we love ignoring what needs to be done for the celebration. Just because I don't like you don't mean I'm not going to party with you. Can somebody continue to pray for Shepherd Man as you pray? I'll party with you. I despise you to your very DNA, but I'll party with you. Don't eat out of my hands. Look it up. 
The word is Saturnalia. That's where all of this been on. Silver band, I love them. Y'all pray for me. I'm still trying to get over my addiction to Christmas music. Don't pray for me, Auntie Meg. She's going to see this. If she ain't live, she's going to see it one day. I know what the origin is, but I mean, Mark, you get the melodies and everything. Yeah. So I'm human. Let me get back to the text so I can let y'all go. Yeah, so we've heard the phrase, we have much to atone for in the situation or circumstances in dire need of much repair. As the etymological root of the term reparation means to repair, then how in the world are we expected and expecting situations in our lives to truly resolve themselves without a little effort to repair what is broken? Why are we expecting to arrive at a place of satisfaction in life when there has been no truthful effort to reconcile between opposite parties? The glaring issue is that we miss quite possibly the single most powerful part of the Christ parable in Matthew chapter 18. Some of y'all feel like I'm just expounding on and on with my own sense of opinion and dogma, but we look through the word in exactly truth ministries. And we're missing possibly the most important part, Sister Whitney, of Matthew chapter 18 in the parable that Christ spoke, which is that the reparations, or in other words, repair, began with the individual that most folks assume was to be perceived completely innocent in the scenario Mama Womack, which was the king. Now, so many of us are waiting to be made whole. Why would the person that was greatly owed in this situation be the individual that you point to, and I'm not just pointing to it, y'all read the story, we read it together, in fact, who began the process of repair or the reparation? It's quiet in here. How about we slightly alter how we view what the king stands for in the parable and make the title of king figurative and make the king literally represent power which kings had, did they not? And which they hold in a kingdom and to represent empowerment a person that does not just hold that power but he uses it and utilizes it based upon the authority that has been needed them because that is what the king was in the parable and or in other words in the Christ analogy. Uh oh, I thought he claimed to never be dogmatic. This sounds dogmatic to me. Hang in there. The king possessed the power and authority to distribute grace to his servants and thus utilized his power and authority to do just that, to extend grace to who owed him. Now, the healing, the repair, and reconciliation of the dead in the parable began from the position of who was empowered to do so. Follow. Sure, he could have imposed his sentence on that servant, which was deep in debt to him, but the hermeneutic, meaning the language, etymology, etym etymology rather, meaning the origin, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, this is exactly what we mentioned, this is what we do, states that the king exercised, listen, Scenario logos. What does that mean? When you take verse 23, for example, and say that he sought to reconcile with the servant, the original Greek is scenario logos, meaning that he made a decision to reconcile and settle the damaging words or speech between them. Now, isn't that fascinating? Now, we're, tell, we're telling you all, and we're exclaiming, and this is all, we ain't making this up, y'all follow. We're exclaiming that this is a parable, meaning that this is an analogy in modern day sense in which Christ was explaining how his father does business in his kingdom. But the original language, although in the analogy example dealt with an extreme debt, the original language that it was found in said that this materializes and summed up to be about a verbal interaction and disagreement between the servant and the master. Isn't that fascinating? Don't get out of my hands. Get your concordance and look at a scenario logos that he sought to reconcile the differences in speech. Now, before y'all start saying, oh, so he really didn't owe him nothing literally, once again, it was an analogy or it was a story, and don't most debt start with our mouth in the first place? Scripture says that death and life lie where? Should we really believe those of us who got a bacon background like Simple Man? Should we 
really believe you when you sign the paper and before it's directly deposited into your account or back in the day where y'all would go to the teller window and get the cash directly. But before you take that action to take hold and seize of what you promised to pay back, should we really believe my whole back that you're going to do it? Oh, and I feel all by myself, but that's all right. Yeah! So many of us, we call ourselves Christians, and I'm telling you all, y'all will do everything that you can if you cannot be complicit with the promissory note that you made. You'll hide a car for 16 years before you let the repo man do it. And you'll come and dance and scream hallelujah and flip and turn. I thought that y'all were trying to be Christ-like. I got to get to work. What that got to do with trusting him? I'm not saying circumstances don't transpire where you fall on hard times, but why is a believer, a believer on the fifth episode of Repo Guy? What that got to do with portraying or seeking or following after the principles of being Christ-like? Couldn't own no man. My discernment is too strong. Y'all don't have to say it, man. I know what the most high has equipped me with, or I wouldn't be pastor and shepherd. And some of y'all would sit down and say, Yeah, thank you for that $250,000 loan. You, you've, been, you've been such a blessing. Hey, I love you, pastor. And when is the first payment? And I wouldn't even tell you. I'd say, Sit right there and give me that paperwork back. You lying thing. You don't plan on paying a dime. Your eye was twitching the whole time. You, you signed your name. Praise the most high that it's him. That's, that, that we serve, and y'all don't serve me. Right. So many of y'all will be homeless. No, I changed my mind. You don't smell like you're going to pay back a dollar. We ran to believers until somebody come turn your electric off for a lack of pain. I better stick to the test. So the original language, the so in the original language, the Christ did not leave the pros or the way that the wording was structured to the assumption that the king himself literally had nothing to atone for with his servant. Or at the very least had the power to begin the distribution of grace from his seat of power and authority because who other than the person who has the capability of the power and authority is best in expediting the making of repairs in the first place. That's the reason why we haven't turned to one another for reparations for blacks, for example, in this country. We turn to where the seat of power and who holds the centralized banking. Y'all come to me for reparations, good luck. Don't hold your breath, you're gonna die. We're seeking a higher source and a higher holding that's supposed to hold us all accountable from where these resources are coming from. Me and Billy ain't paying y'all. So how come y'all can say amen to that? But when it comes down to our individual lives, we're not looking at who holds the power to heal or repair to be the person to expedite the repairs. It was clear that the dude that was 10,000 bags of gold in debt, he was bankrupt and morally corrupt. Have you progressed with this thing so that we can get down? I'm almost there. The issue we're having today, beloved, is everybody is firmly standing in line, waiting to receive our repair from those that helped to break us. Tell me about it. Waiting patiently for the I'm sorry to come in. Waiting patiently for somebody to write that check. Waiting patiently. Got a high dentist bill because we done grit our teeth down almost to the gums. We're still waiting patiently. Yeah. No, uh, one day maybe they'll do good, but they slop it and nasty, irresponsible sale and finally pay back that two dollars and seventy-eight cents that they owe you. I can taste that tasty cake now, because that's about all you're gonna be able to buy it. And when I say that, I'm talking about going to A plus or the turkey heel and just getting one of one in the pack. Right, right. Dolly and them and the hostess, they so stingy. You're gonna pay a small fortune for just one. Mama, you remember when we get a whole package of Twinkies? Now they serve in a single wrapper, and they ain't as good as what they was before. 
But good luck trying to feed yourself and be satisfied with that 2,073 cents that you still pray. You won't pray for the Holy Ghost, but you still pray that so and so still owe you for better ministry. Lord, help us. <sighs> We're standing in line, and there's no shortage to that line of people that are waiting to be made whole. But with everyone waiting in line to be repaired, we're missing the entire part and an entire and important angle of the reparation process, which is that someone has to do the repair. And can I stand in line at this point? Let me do a time check because I don't want to hold y'all. Yeah, okay. I did. Mark, you can't see too good, but it's like there's a mic here and then there's a light stand and then there's this mic that stand this one on that I'm standing behind. All of us waiting for you may go. And very close approximately eight meters ahead is to it. Mark back there by the wall. He's a little older than us, so you know he got to lean back against that wall because he's getting tired and like, but we all wait in line for repair. I got just one question to ask. Who are we waiting for? Who's gonna do the repairing? If everybody's in the line, Sister Griffin, to be prepared. Let me ask this question. Who's the mechanic today? Who has the power in all these broken situations to begin distributing grace in order for grace to begin to be paid forward? Such as was the obvious expectation of the king and master in the Christ parable. I realize that the Almighty is the ultimate distributor of grace. So that just checks some of y'all that was thinking, huh, we ain't gonna get grace down here. Grace is given divine. I realize that. But Paul the Apostle wrote in his letter to the body and say at Rome, Romans chapter 13, verse 8, and we're referencing the New International Version of the English translation. Listen, y'all, because we forget about this scripture. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love, one another, to one another rather, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. I'll tell you who the mechanics are today, beloved, if y'all haven't figured it out by now. I'll tell you who is responsible for beginning the healing process and repair process down here in this corporeal and earthly realm. It's all of us that have been harmed and broken. I'm going to say that again. It's all of us that have been harmed and broken. Understand this up. I'm going to say it again. It's all of us that have been harmed and broken. Listen, but subsequently have also broken and brought injury to others. Oh, we forgot about that part. You ever heard the phrase hurt people, hurt people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We in the reparation line, but some of us need to systematically step out and step in and put on our mechanics uniform and start healing and start the healing process. Because after all, that's the main thing that we miss in that parable. And the person who seemed the most righteous, dare I say, if we are supposed to add characterization to his, and that's why you're having such a hard time with it, to his analogy or to his parable, don't the king represent the heavenly father? better is in a place to start repairing than the person who had all the power to repair. But that doesn't leave us because it was supposed to be paid forward. The, 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 the master and the king was looking for his grace to be extended from the person that the grace was extended to, which draws us in, which means that you in fact are a mechanic even though somebody owes you repair. Lord have mercy. One of the primary reasons why it's so easy for most individuals to miss this part, Uncle Billy, an angle of the reparations process is because our adversary, Hase, has been very effective at providing distractions, misdirection, and toxic affirmations. Toxic affirmation. <laughs> is that oxymoronic? So that the status quo Sister Griffin remains the same. There are several layers of deception the adversary has implemented as an attempt to misguide mankind's personal decision-making and choices 
on every level. Today, before I close, I'll provide you with four major examples. Y'all holding on to y'all seats? Minister Jordan, example number one, over group thinking. Some of y'all need to leave the internet and social media alone. It's keeping you in need of reparations. It's keeping you broken. Over group thinking and being influenced by popular consensus has always been a major stumbling block to exercising our individual power to repair the things we know in our hearts that we ourselves have broken. Yeah, it's easy to fixate on what has broken you. What did you break? If we can find enough yes men and yes women that will stroke our ego and champion our cause to not self-improve or be accountable from the standpoint of where we actually have fallen short ourselves, then we more than likely will side with the group of folks that will have us doing nothing ourselves to heal or repair situations that we helped to break. Let me give you an example. Vanessa, my cousin. How did the man get that far in debt in the first place? Right. Where's our checks and balances? Where are the people that live with us that say, let's not go crazy this holiday season. Let's be more austere with our finances. You know we just made a major purchase. You know we just, but what about all the people that are looking for gifts? There are plenty of people in the yes man corner. The group thinkers, the power of consensus, Everybody going to show up with something. I got to show up with something too. If we don't stop leaving everybody alone, being hanging around everybody and finding people to justify our mess is what's going to send us to eternal damnation if we don't. Oh, well, y'all ain't got to hear me today. But at the end of the day, I know I'm not, this mess ain't falling on deaf ears. This mess is what's for somebody today. Don't apologize to that king. That king, all that work and that will, your little bags are gone. Ain't gonna help to fix or change nothing. We love going and finding somebody that's gonna cause us not to be accountable rather than hold us accountable. And that's one of the major things that the enemy has in place that has us ducking and dodging the reparations that we owe to other people. Listen, my apology to them ain't gonna change them from being the nasty person that they are overtly. My getting that thing right ain't going to change the aspects of what's broken with exact truth in the first place. Oh, it's quiet now. We can always go and find two or three people that'll tell you, don't say nothing. I wouldn't say nothing. I wouldn't apologize at all. Don't let nobody help you send you to hell. Right, right, right. They'll be the first person in hell or in the lake standing your plan. The person who told you don't get stuff right. Let me move on. It's nothing worse than a who's going to dance first prior to stand up. Y'all been to the parties. Figuratively speaking, when everybody's standing on the sidelines, helping throw the party in the first place. Why are we going to spend all of this money? Why are we going to break down all of these barriers? Why are we going to go through all this effort to throw a party and then don't nobody dance? And everybody around the walls is acting like that they didn't throw the party. Satan loves to throw their more guilty than you pity party. Let me move on. The problem with that mode of thinking is that it's clear that we're running out of time to repair what is broken in our lives. Tomorrow clearly isn't promised to any of us, and more and more we're seeing folks leave this life carrying brokenness into their individual judgment. Some of y'all are kissing one another and still ain't said I'm sorry for those destructive things that you said to one another that honestly we need atonement and reparations for because we hadn't gotten, haven't gotten over them. Some of y'all been in 16 prayer lines, made 16 admissions, and still not free from your church hurt. I better move on. You know how I know? Because I can tell by your fruit. I'm sorry. Silver bell. That don't help. Number two, procrastination regarding actionable choices pertaining to purpose. An apathetic mind frame which constantly convinces itself that there will always be time to react and comply when in reality the only true action of ability that is being taken is the passage of time with every remaining 
exactly with everything and everyone remains exactly the way they have and it has always been. Cousin Joe, I just like talking to the people. I'm not talking to y'all directly. I just like talking to the people that's in front of me. We're letting days, not you and I, because we're perfect cousins. But every day, the people that we see out there, you know, our colleagues and fellow men, they're letting days pass by saying, I would just act, just act like me and you ain't perfect cousins. Just say hypothetically that, you know, you and I may in some regard been too hard or whatever. And oh, Vanessa, enjoy apology. Oh, it's sunny outside, and Vanessa and Joy, they do seem particularly beautiful and radiant today. They seem like they woke up in a good mood. I always have time to apologize. Let me tell you something. You're not going to always have time to offer the repair that is in your power to do. But the enemy loves having us put off tomorrow, till tomorrow, what we should be doing today. Yeah, a, number three, a strong propensity to practice avoidance. Listen, now this is for somebody today. Let me take off. Tom Ford. We got no Tom Ford. I'm not giving. A strong propensity to practice avoidance by running from the problems and issues that we've contributed to Secretary Davis or have helped to cause. Isn't it amazing that so many people have been called to move on or to leave problems or problematic areas? My question is, who called to stay and remain to fix the ones in the room? Isn't it convenient, Minister Jordan, that the Lord is calling us to Istanbul and we ain't served him yet, bro? Right? Isn't it amazing that so many people are called to their fourth and fifth spouse? And the only thing that centralized Minister Davis in all of those divorces is you. Not you, but you know. I always wondered about that. You on your 16th day? The only person that's been in all 16 of the marriages and subsequently all 15 of those five divorces are you. Yet the problem is with everybody else you was married to. Y'all don't like this message too much. It's good that I'm almost at the end. Yeah, rather than repairing, we run. I got some colleagues. They got a bad reputation. They name come up pastors, laymen, ushers. It's a true story. The other day, we were with a repair man that wasn't even of our own culture. He had the best joke about this one position, position in the area. You know why the bad reputation spread that much? Because people run from situation to the next situation without making the last situation that they jacked up on. Some of y'all talking about a proud member of exactly two ministry. You ain't that proud. You just can't go back to Bob and Peter and House of Prayer. They got your face on the poster board as soon as you come in. That person is excommunicated. Don't allow them to fellowship. <laughs> yeah, we runners. Not repairers, a lot of times runners. It is, for example, why many folks in sparsely populated parts of the country, y'all gonna love this, are petitioning for folks from densely populated cities, Mama Womack, to stay exactly where you are. Or bring the people from California in. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You all have collaborated to nearly destroy the areas where you're from. You know, people are homeless. They can't even afford to live in a box in California. Don't y'all come to Texas. Y'all heard that? Now you want to bring those poisonous mind frames and the ineffective laws and all that high taxation to this region of the country. No, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did y'all move from a place where y'all was contributing to, to crazy ass that law and now you're going to take shelter in a place that ain't that bad yet? Let me continue to move on. Double and sometimes, number four, double and sometimes triple standards, just the last one, with regards to dealing with and coexisting with others. How many standards? Double and sometimes triple, mother-in-law, standards. Once again, the amount of people that fall, that fail to hold themselves accountable in this day and time has become startling. For example, Christ stated in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, in I mean, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Right. Right. How many of us steadily find ourselves accusing folks of being weak while ignoring our own very weaknesses? Hypocrisy has always served as a major stumbling block against Christ and God. Satan knows that there is an endless array of people willing to judge and cast sentence on other folks that clearly should be on trial themselves. Too many people today, listen, too many people today are far too comfortable being broke. I said, too many of y'all are far too comfortable being broke. And I don't mean not having enough. By broke, I mean being broken. There's stuff about you that is not fixed. And you have taken that into forward subject, subsequent relationships. You have taken that into new job opportunities. You've taken that into new friendships. Your brokenness. New don't fix what's broken. Sitting around on the back lot of life's repair shop waiting for somebody to come and repair and restore you when you literally owe other folk restoration and repair yourself. Why are we so impatient with apologies and we owe them? What? How about you be like the king and you get it? Right. Folks running around today calling each other kings and queens anyway. Hey king. <laughs> What's good queen? How about you be like the king in the parable in Matthew chapter 18 and pardon some folk there? Well, king. Well. Queen. So that healing and repair can more easily take place overall. Healing like this. Give me something, Brother Billy. I'm sorry. Why the person that you apologize apologizing to may ask, because the most high God literally saved my life. How many people know? But then I still decided to hate you rather than forgive you despite his forgiving me. So I'm asking for forgiveness. Is anybody here today? Forgive me! Why? The person that you are asking forgiveness is stated because God healed my body, but then to do harm to yours. So forgive me is the power that you have as an act of jubilee. Forget what you owe me. Huh? Forget what I owe you. Why? No, forget what you owe me. We're good. The other person asks, why would you do that as much as I owe you? Because I have much to forgive for on my end. Because not so long ago, the Heavenly Father healed my mind of mental illness and of torment spiritually, and then I went and cursed the closest ones to me with my tongue. So as an act of contrition, starting the process out, because I too owe much, despite the fact that you owe me, forgive me and I forgive you. Beloved, what direction did you go in when your allotment of grace was bestowed upon you? Tell me. We're close. That's a powerful question today. What direction did you choose to go in? We're the servants today. Hello, somebody. What direction did you choose to go in when your allotment of grace was bestowed upon you? Did you decide to pay that grace forward? By saying, he forgave me of much, I'm going to forgive others. Or did you take your unmerited freedom, that unmerited favor, and forthrightly punish someone who owed you a debt? Acting brand new. Like you never owed a debt yourself. In conclusion, and we're going to pray and we're going to close. Beloved, this message today is not about releasing everybody from their natural and spiritual debt that they owe you. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus, because I got a lot of debts out there, and I was hoping that I didn't have to be in the, the motion of jubilee, because uh, my God, I want some of that back. T -t Today is not about letting everybody off the hook, beloved. 
Certainly sounded that way. No. It's about not standing around waiting for your reparations to arrive when all the while you owe reparations to other people. Let's not forget that the term reparations means to repair. And nobody is in a better position to repair what's broken than the people who hold power. Some of you all are free because of the grace and the mercy of the Most High God of the Hebrews that took compassion on us and found us in a broken place and elevated us from that broken place to a place of power and of restoration. And you may have been broken and you may be owed much by others, but you have the power and the authority and the choice to operate and to expedite the reparation process because you sit in a seat of power. Don't be that person that says, I'm good and it's all good in the hood and let the whole rest of the world burn when you've received the benefit of being made whole by the king. How about we try paying it forward? How about we don't feel like that we're going out of our way? How about we just, with the place of power that we sit in, pay back all that we know that we owe? Come honest on all of the things that we've been disingenuous about. So that situations can heal because can they really heal without the truth? Everybody with bowed heads today. Heavenly Father, we're going to go right to the forgiveness part of our prayer. Because Lord knows, from shepherd man on, I've lived a life where there has been much to atone for. There has been much to repair. But I've spent a large percentage of my life dismissing what I need to repair because of what I felt like has been owed to me. I'll speak for myself because I can only speak for myself. Heavenly Father, forgive me. I stand before you and your congregation humbly seeking your forgiveness. And anyone standing there in harmony and in fellowship with the standpoint that Shepherd Man is coming from, we solicit forgiveness on their behalf as well. And we believe that forgiveness will never be remiss today. It's nigh us because of the powerful sacrifice of the ultimate lamb that was without blemish that had no debt or ought to anyone, but started the reparation process himself nonetheless by coming down and dying for our sins, but not staying dead, rising again, and then not just rising, but ascending to you where currently, and today is an example of this, making intercession and seating, interceding on the behalf of each and every one of us that believe. Heavenly Father, forgive us, give us the power to live and walk in repair, not just talk repair and remain broken in our heart, but from our heart premise, truly be repaired and then begin to have the fruit of freedom so that it can spread in all of our life and our circumstances. We ask these blessings and many more in that great and powerful name, Yeshua, Yehoshua HaMashiach, Christ's name we pray. Come on, somebody put a blessed hand on that if we praise the most high for this sailing of word today. Oh, you got power today to begin the reparation process yourself. You don't just have to wait in line endlessly for some mysterious agent to come and start repairing things. Start with the power that has been needed to you. Y'all put me in heaven. Remember to cover me. Help me say that I might go in peace and continue to keep me lifted. We're going on. That I might go in spirit. Keep my name on your lips. Yes. And when you pray. Remember that I need you to tell somebody to cover, 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 cover,
Shabbat Shalom. 